Welcome to NSD 323 Study Session 12 Disseminated Intravascular Coagulation DIC Introduction Disseminated Intravascular Coagulation DIC, also known as Disseminated Intravascular Coagulopathy or less commonly as Consumptive Coagulopathy is a pathological activation of coagulation, blood clotting, mechanisms that happens in response to a variety of diseases. DHIC leads to the formation of small blood clots inside the blood vessels throughout the body. As the small clots consume coagulation proteins and platelets, normal coagulation is disrupted and abnormal bleeding occurs from the skin, e.g from sites where blood samples were taken, the gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory tract, and surgical wounds. The small clots also disrupt normal blood flow to organs such as the kidneys, which may malfunction as a result. DHIC can occur acutely, but also on a slower, chronic basis, depending on the underlying problem. It is common in the critically ill and may participate in the development of multiple organ failure, which may lead to death. DIC is rare when the fetus is alive and it usually starts to resolve when the baby is born. Learning Outcomes After this study, you should be able to 1. Mention the causes of disseminated intravascular coagulation DIC. 2. Discuss pain management in labor. 3. Explain pathophysiology of pain. 4. Elaborate on transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. Tense. Causes of disseminated intravascular coagulation. DHIC. DHIC is never a primary disease. It always occurs as a response to another disease process. Such an event triggers widespread clotting with the formation of microthrombin throughout the circulation. Clotting factors are used up. The DIC triggers fibrinolysis and the production of fibrin degradation products. Fibrin degradation products reduce the efficacy of normal blood clotting. A paradoxical feedback system is therefore set up in which clotting is the primary clotting. But hemorrhage is the clinical finding. When DIC occurred during or after birth, the reduced level of clotting factors and the presence of fibrin degradation products inhibit myometrial action and prevents the uterine muscles from constricting the blood vessels in the normal way at the placenta site leading to torrential hemorrhage. DIC can occur in the following conditions. Visible blood loss may be observed to remain uncoagulated for several minutes and even when clotting, thus occur the clot is unstable. Microthrombin may cause circulatory obstruction in the small blood vessels. The effect of this vary from cyanosis of fingers and toes to cerebrovascular accident and multiple organ failure. Placenta abruption. Owing to the damage of tissue at the placenta site, large quantity of thromboplastin are released into circulation and may cause DHIC. However, if the placenta is delivered as soon as possible after the abruption, the risk of DHIC is reduced. Intrauterine fetal death. If the dead fetus is retained in utero, more than three to four weeks, then thromboplastin is released from the tissues of the dead fetus. This enter the maternal circulation and deplete clotting factors. DIC can occur in the following conditions. Placenta separated from the uterus. External bleeding. Internal bleeding. Amniotic fluid embolism. If death does not occur from maternal collapse, DIC may develop. 
thromboplastin in the amniotic fluid is responsible for setting up the cascade of clotting. Intrauterine infection. The cause of this includes septic abortion, hyacidiform mole, placenta acrid, and endometrial infection before or after birth. DIC is caused by endotoxins entering the circulation and damaging the blood vessels. Therefore, there is need to treat both the DIC and infection aggressively with antibiotics. Diagnosis Diagnosis is usually suggested by the following conditions. Severe cases with hemorrhage. The PT and APTT are usually very prolonged and the fibrinogen level markedly reduced. High levels of fibrin degradation products, including d diamond are found owing to the intense fibrinolytic activity stimulated by the presence of fibrin in the circulation. Definitive diagnosis depends on the result of thrombocytopenia prolongation of prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time A low fibrinogen concentration increased levels of fibrin degradation products. There is severe thrombocytopenia. The blood film may show fragmented red blood cells, skin to sides. Mild cases without bleeding. There is increased synthesis of coagulation factors and platelets. PT, APTT, and platelet counts are normal. Fibrin degradation products are raised. Management or aims of management of DIC. The following are the aims of management of DIC. 1. To manage the underlying cause and remove the stimulus provoking DIC. 2. To ensure the volume of circulating blood volume. 3. To replace the use of clotting factors and destroyed red blood cells. 4. The only effective treatment is the reversal of the underlying cause. 5. Anticoagulants are given exceedingly rarely only when thrombose formation is likely to lead to imminent death, such as in coronary artery thrombosis or cerebrovascular thrombosis. 6. Platelets may be transfused if counts are less than 5,000 to 10,000 mHm and massive hemorrhage is occurring. Fresh frozen plasma may be administered in an attempt to replenish coagulation factors and antithrombotic factors. Although these are only temporary measures and may result in the increased development of thrombosis. In some situations, infusion with antithrombin may be necessary. Prognosis Prognosis varies depending on the underlying disorder and the extent of the intravascular thrombosis. Clotting The prognosis for those with DHIC, regardless of course, is often grim. Between 10% and 50% of patients will die. DHIC with sepsis infection has a significantly higher rate of death than DIC associated with trauma. Pain management in labor. It is not possible to assess how much pain a person is feeling because pain cannot be measured. Pain leads to physical exhaustion and lessens the woman's confidence. Pain threshold varies from one individual to the other so the woman in labor must be relieved from pain and baby safety must be ensured. Causes of pain in labor. The following are the causes of pain in labor. Uterine contraction, the dilatation of cervix in first stage and stretching of the vagina and pelvic floor in late first stage and second stage. Painful stimuli transmitted by thoracic, lumbar and sacral nerves. Pain manifests itself as cramping in the abdomen, groin and back, as well as a tired, aching feeling all over. Pain management is the alleviation of reduction of pain during labor 
through series of activities. This may include pharmacological and non pharmacological interventions. The aim of pain management in labor is to reduce stress and anxiety. The objective is to provide maximum relief while maintaining maximum safety for mother and fetus. The following are other causes of pain during labor. First stage, uterine muscle contractions, pressure on the cervix or cervical stretching, pressure on bladder and urethra, distension of the lower uterine segment, pressure on nerve, ganglia around the uterus. Second stage, stretching of vagina and perineum. Third stage, episiotomy, lacerations, uterine contraction in placenta expulsion. Fourth stage, repair of episiotomy. Factors that influence pain perception. The following factors affect pain perception. Fear and anxiety, personality, fatigue, culture and social factors, expectation, fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety heightens the individual's response to pain, e.g. fear of unknown, previous bad experience. Personality. This plays an important role in the woman's response to pain. A tense and anxious woman will respond poorly to pain and cope less. Fatigue. A woman who is fatigued will tolerate pain less, e.g. in prolonged labor. Culture and social factors. These also play a part. While some culture encourage stoicism, others encourage expression of feelings. Expectations. A woman who is realistic in her expectations is well equipped and will cope better with labor pain. Pain skills. These are special tools that can help caregivers measure how much pain you feel. There are many pain skills that include numbers or cartoon faces. Your caregiver may have you to rate the pain on a scale of 0 to 10. Pathophysiology of pain. Pain involves four physiological processes, which include the following transduction, transmission, modulation, perception. Pain begins when there is local tissue damage or injury, which is a noxious stimulus of sensory nerve endings causing release of inflammatory substances, prostaglandin, histamine serotonin, bradycarnia, and substance P. This will lead to generation of electric impulse, transduction, at peripheral sensory nerve ending. Impulse travel to dorsal roots, ganglion, and posterior horn of the spinal cord, known as first neuron. Second neuron from posterior on to spinal cord transmits impulse via medulla oblongata, pons varoli, and midbrain to the thalamus. Third neuron transmits to sensory cortex spinal cord. In the spinal cord, fast pain and slow pain are carried to the brain via different pathways. The impulse of the fast pain goes to specific and limited areas on the surface of the brain. The cortex allowing for relatively precise location of the pain stimulus before an individual perceives a painful stimulus. Perception, cock and ribbons, 2004. The impulse from slow pain is distributed diffusely in the brain. Each area of the brain elicits a different response, which explains the whole range of symptoms 
that pain can cause such as suffering, sleeping difficulties, because the pain stimulates the weak center and a depressed mood. Methods of pain relief in labor. Non-pharmaceutical. The most effective pain management begins long before the baby is born, with education including classes that teach relaxation techniques and breathing methods. Psychological method of relieving pain in labor is the most important aspect of pain relief because a patient who is already apprehensive with labor pain will relax if she is admitted into a clean, well-organized, calm and reassuring environment. Education is one of the best ways to manage pain because simply knowing what to expect promotes relaxation and calms fears. Given information will help to allay anxiety. The woman in labor is also allowed to participate in planning and meet with the staff that will take care of her before, during and after labor. Methods of pain relief in labor. The midwife must be sympathetic and understanding. This will allay her fears, relax more, and be able to cope with the pain. The personality of the midwife should reflect kindness, interest in the patient with kind words and deeds as she gives care. Some women prefer to avoid analgesic medication during childbirth. They can still try to alleviate labor pain using psychological preparation education, massage, acupuncture, tense units use, hypnosis, or water therapy in a tube or shower. Psychological control covers preparation for labor and support during labor. Relaxed environment is highly appreciated. Some women like to have someone to support them during labor and birth, such as the father of the baby a family member, a close friend, or the partner also the freedom to move about during labor. The human body also has a chemical response to pain by releasing endorphins. Endorphins are present before, during, and immediately after childbirth. Some people believe that this hormone can induce feelings of pleasure and euphoria during childbirth reducing the risk of maternal depression some weeks later. Water birth is an option chosen by some women for pain relief during labor and childbirth. And some studies have shown water birth in an uncomplicated pregnancy to reduce the need for analgesia without evidence of increased risk to mother or newborn. Hot water tubes are available in many hospitals and bathing centers. Physical comforts. Measures should be provided such as gentle exercise, breathing, posture and relaxation techniques help in early labor. Massage can help to refresh muscles. Sipping warm tea or cool water can keep the patient hydrated and energized. A warm bath, comfortable gun, oral care, comfortable position with adequate bladder and bowel care. Position changes. Some positions improve the baby's ability to navigate through the pelvis. Some positions can help to reduce the pressure associated with a back labor. Other positions make it easier to relax the body and rest. Some medical interventions will limit the woman's ability to change positions. Example is the use of intravenous infusion. Transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, TENS. The use of TENS is effective, particularly in early labor. Treatment with TENS consists of attaching electrodes to the woman's back. The low voltage electric current passed across stimulates the body to produce endogenous opioids. It can be controlled by the woman. There is need to give information and teach the use of TENS prenatally. It takes about 30 minutes before an effect is felt. The intensity can be increased to cope with the increased pain of contractions. 
mental relaxation techniques. There are various mental relaxation techniques that can be used to promote relaxation during labor. Some techniques aim to focus thoughts, others to distraction or diversion. For success to be achieved at using mental relaxation techniques during labor, the midwife should teach clients how to practice it during antenatal periods. Examples Cognitive or behavioral strategies inclusive of distraction, relaxation, imagery, and breathing techniques. Meditation and mind medicine techniques are also used for pain control during labor and delivery. These techniques are used in conjunction with progressive muscle relaxation and many other forms of relaxation for the mind and body to aid in pain control for women during childbirth. One such technique is the use of hypnosis in childbirth. Alternative method of mental relaxation. Alternative methods. Acupuncture, homopathy, herbalism, aromatherapy, yoga and meditation. Hypnosis. A new mode of analgesia is sterile water injection placed just underneath the skin in the most painful spots during labor. A control trial in Iran of 0.5 ml injections was conducted with normal saline, which revealed a statistical superiority with water over saline. Support during labor is also necessary. The midwife should help massage the patient's back during contractions, provide hygiene and comfort positioning, bladder and bowel care. Pharmaceutical management of pain, the use of drugs, different measures for pain control, have varying degrees of success and side effects to the woman and her baby. The choice of drugs for relief of pain is based on the following. Progress of labor, the patient's need, effect on the uterine contraction and fetus, availability of drugs. 1. Analgesics. These are drugs used in labor that are supposed to relieve pain without rendering the patient unconscious. Examples are Panadol, Aspirin, ETC. 2. Narcotics or opioids. These drugs allay anxiety and induce sleep. They are strong analgesics with some sedative effects and will reduce ability to sense pain or discomfort in the whole body. The use of drugs. Examples are Petidine, with or without Prometazine may be used early in labor, as well as other opioids such as morphine, petilofan, and fortal. But if given too close to birth, there is a risk of respiratory depression in the infant. 3. Amniotic fluid embolism. This induced sleep. Anticonvulsants such as chloride, dazepirine, omnopone. ETC. 4. Tranquilizers. They help to calm the patients, such as phenogan. 5. Sedatives. Induce sleep. Examples are barbiturates. 6. Lactic cocktail. Refers to any of various mixtures of phenotizine, derivatives, and petidine for intravenous administration. Examples are clopromazine. Lagactyl 50 mg, petidine 100 mg, mixed and given slowly intravenously until a state of sedative, tranquility, and analgesia is produced. It is used in management of preeclampsia and enclapsia and for breech deliveries and cesarean section. 7. Inhalational analgesia. This is permitted by the midwife board. It is used on elder women in late first stage of labor, relatively safe in moderate dose as it is easily excreted from lungs and has minimal effects on fetus and it may be used with other analgesics. In premips, they are volatile agents which are excreted fairly quickly from the body. They include entonox, 
a premixed nitrous oxide 50% and oxygen 50%. 8. Trilene, Tricolorethylene. This is a blue liquid that evaporates easily into the hair to form a non-inflammable vapor. It is an anesthetic agent with analgesic action. The anesthetic effect depends on the concentration. It is administered in emotory automatic inhaler apparatus. 9. Obstetric Anesthesia Anesthesia means absence of sensation and free from pain or reversible depression of all the senses. Types of anesthesia are 1. General Anesthesia 2. Regional Anesthesia 3. Local Anesthesia 10. Epidural or spinal medication. This is a technique whereby local anesthesia solution is injected into the subarachnoid space, that is, into CSF. It is referred to as regional blocks because the medication prevents the nerves from sending signals to the brain. It reduces pain in parts of the body from the abdomen down. Local anesthetic agents like lignocaine can be used for this. It is given because of various complications that could result in assisted birth. 11. Pudenda block. A local anesthesia is injected adjacent to the pudenda nerves just below the ischial spines where they supply pelvic floor, vulva and perineum. 12. Paracervical block. This is a technique whereby the paracervical plexus are blocked. It is used in prolonged labor. 10 milliliters, 10 mls of 1% lignocaine solution is injected into the lateral follicles of the vagina. It reduces pain and backache for about 2 to 3 hours. There is risk of bradycardia and fetal death may occur due to spasms of uterine vessels. Local anesthesia, 10 milliliters of 1% lignocaine solution is infiltrated into the perineum for episiotomy. The technique used will depend on the type of episiotomy. Conclusion The process of labor and childbirth bring about the event that the woman has been anticipating throughout her pregnancy. The forces of labor are referred to as four P's. They are passage, passenger, power, and psyche. These important factors must work together for labor to progress normally. An alteration in any one or a combination of the factors can alter the outcome of labor. The length of labor varies widely and is influenced by parity, birth interval, and psychological state of the woman in labor. Psyche, presentation, position, pelvic shape, and size and character of uterine contractions. Sound knowledge of physiology of labor aids the midwife in the course of her managing the patients. Summary, in study session 12, we have learned that causes of disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. The DIC triggers fibrinolysis and the production of fibrin, degradation products. The following are the condition of DIC. Placenta abruption, intrauterine fetal death, amniotic fluid embolism, intrauterine infection. Prognosis varies depending on the underlying disorder and the extent of the intravascular thrombosis, clotting, pain management in labor. Pain threshold varies from one individual to the other, so the woman in labor must be relieved from pain and baby safety must be ensured. Factors that influence pain perception in the following, fear and anxiety, personality, fatigue, culture and social factors, expectations, Pathophysiology of pain. Pain involves four physiological processes which include the following transduction, transmission, 
modulation, perception, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, tens. The use of tens is effective, particularly in early labor. Treatment with tens consists of attaching electrodes to the woman's back. End of study session 12. Thanks for listening.